It is a Tuesday after the big derby at the weekend. The one that ended 3-3. The one that has not decided anything now until the end of the season. And the one that was just pure chaos, let's be honest. Um, that second half from Celtic. Not the best performance we've ever seen. The first half was quite positive without it being the best performance we've ever seen. And again, we called it on the show. We called it on the show. There would be booze at halftime and then it would be a nice little walk of honour around the pitch uh, to the fans now happy with the Rangers players having not lost the game uh, in front of their own fans, in front of only their own fans at Ibrox. Alan Morrison and James are with me here on the Huddle Breakdown as always. How are we, lads? Hi, hi. Doing well, thanks. James, is- James, have you recovered from the yeah. big weekend in uh, NYC watching uh, Celtic draw with Rangers? Yes, actually, I um, I cut it off a little early. I, I you know normally if we would have won, it probably would have turned into a total debacle. But um, given given the sequencing of the game, I think that the mood was not as jovial as it was for a, a bit of time during the match. So. Uh, the pub was not as full as it could have otherwise been <laughs> after the game. Mm. And again, for context, this started at, I got to the pub at uh, 6.40 a.m. So I'm an old, fat, middle-aged guy. I mean, starting uh, having pints that early, it, 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 ma- marathons don't exist that much anymore without <laughs> incurring massive damage and punishment for several days. So, uh, But yes, it was. I, I was sober on the train on the way home, if you can believe that. Sober and sad, I would imagine. No, um, not sad. No, no. <laughs> I actually, uh, I took a picture of my Garmin watch after Adamita scored what I thought was the winner, and I had a full, <laughs> I had a full big thing planned for my big apology on the huddle breakdown uh, for Adamita, but uh, my heart rate was at one thirty after uh, Adamita scored that goal and then it was flatlined by the end after the Matondo uh, equalizer. Uh, Alan, I mean, we'll talk about the game in depth now on this podcast, but your general reaction to the performance and the the game and the result? Well, I mean, ultimately disappointing because when you're 2-0 up and you, then you end up losing 3-3, it's, it's just really disappointing. So, you know. <laughs> Well, that is, the, I guess that, that is one of the questions that I had was that this somehow for Celtic in many ways, it feels like a win and it also feels like a loss because of the manner of it. But ultimately in the real cold light of day, it was a draw. So like, I mean, I don't, I generally don't know how the atmosphere would have felt in the Celtic dressing room after this game. It seems like from at least what Matt O'Reilly has been posting that it's one of sort of like together togetherness and, and things, things like that. But do you think like, will Rogers and the players be annoyed by this result or will they think, you know what, this is actually quite positive for us? I think certainly in the first half, they were the, the only team that had a coherent game plan and they executed on it pretty well. Um, and so they'll be pleased about that. They'll be pleased at the fact that they, again, led the game um, and, and, and a lot of the, well, we'll maybe come on to this. A lot of the XG really comes down to again to game state in terms of one team is always chasing these games, one team's in the lead. That that's had a big impact across three matches actually. If you look at the XG trends there, um, I think all all taking into account all that all that you know was in the game and all that was in the day in terms of you know no fans, the hostility, the the constant threat of being landed with a bottle or a coin or something, all that. You know the 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 beaten factor. Um, you know Celtic at the end of the day will be pleased. I think we'll get onto some bits that hopefully Rogers reflects on in terms of his own performance. Um, but what I think they should feel is that they should feel that they are the better football team, and they should feel that they should go on and win this league. Yeah, that was my overriding feeling for sure in all of the games so far against Rangers. It's just that. Like we, we we are a better team, and even ex uh, Joey Barton or sorry ex Rangers player Joey Barton, I know he's not uh, one to be listening to these days, but even he said after that first half, he tweeted to say that at least seven or eight of the Celtic players would make it in the Premier League, and he said that not a single one from that Rangers team 
would make it barely in the championship, let alone in the Premier League. So he's probably playing on a little bit of bitterness considering the club has, uh, for some reason, cut ties with him. So uh, I think that reflected the mood uh, within uh, the Rangers and within Mordor, as somebody described it to me uh, on Twitter over the course of the weekend, which I thought was great. We went into Mordor and we came out with a, a draw, which I think... Uh, satisfied all around um, I mean James it it really started brilliantly with um, James Tavernier's uh, once again the successful failure of the best Rangers captain ever in my eyes uh, just getting really closed down by Meda and then I think the wind probably played a little bit of a role in this to be honest but um, yeah G- great start followed by an even better start when Matt O'Reilly uh the penalty in and Celtic are 2 up but from that point onwards, it's sort of like, okay, what's going to happen? And chaos is what happened. Yeah, I mean, you know, the old saying, you make your own luck. And I think that um, that was an example. I agree with you. The wind was a big, uh, a big aspect. Um, the other aspect is, and Alan will attest to this, something he and I have talked about through the season, is that the legend of Butlin is different than the reality of Butlin, which is to say that uh, if you look at kind of comprehensive metrics, um, it's kind of not that much different between him and Hart this season. Uh, But the composition of how you get there is different, meaning that Butlin's shock uh, stopping has objectively been better uh, for the season, but he is so bad off his line and with his feet you know, kind of the rest of keeper play sweeping and parrying and all this other stuff that collectively, when you throw that together, he's basically been about, you know, the same as Hart. Um, And obviously with shot stopping being such a huge component of keeper play, that tells you how bad he's been. So again, I, the wind made it more difficult, but he's not the keeper that's going to come out and get that ball, which you could argue a nimble athletic keeper probably could have, you know, uh, that seems to have been what Tavernier might have been thinking, which, again, would be stupid given who his keeper is. <laughs> um, and, and the win may have, you know, confused him a bit. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, the fact that it kind of deflected off of Maeda's shin and went exactly where it did and Butlin's backpedaling and, you know, because if, if he's in a stable position, Butlin might save that. Uh, it was within reach of, of a distance if he had been – uh, collected himself um, prior to the the impact of the ball. So yeah, I mean, it's just one of those. That's you know when we talk about variance, that, that's this is the kind of thing that just kind of you know breaks into the game. And there's plenty of other variants we'll get onto as the game progressed, but uh, that was certainly a positive one and a jaw dropping one. I was I was in the pub, my jaw dropped. It was just like I can't believe this just happened. I mean, it was just incredible. Yeah, I was um, <clears throat> I was watching this in my home house and I've been told before to dial it down a bit, dial it down a touch when Celtic are playing Rangers. So I had that in mind. I was I was gonna be well behaved. I wasn't gonna shout. I wasn't gonna scream. And then within twenty six seconds I was jumping up and shouting because you just don't expect something like that to happen. Um I mean it is about time that it has happened for Maeda because the amount of times where he's gone come close where the goal he caught a goalkeeper out and it's just gone out wide. Like it is about time that one of these went in. So I mean, no better time to do it than twenty six seconds into <laughs> the Derby match. So it was a it was a brilliant start. But um Alan, we spoke before the game about Hitate and his return to the midfield and the midfield being the key battle. So we might start there. I mean, Celtic absolutely demolished them in the first half with the midfield. Like they were tearing him apart. It I mean, I wouldn't even say it was the midfield. I would say it was just the general um, way that Celtic set up. And and it was, it was weird because it's not a way that you see Celtic play very often. It was akin to how you would see in a Jose Mourinho team play, whereby they were almost saying to, to the Rangers, right, you have the ball, right? And we'll wait for you to make a mistake. And then when we, we make a mistake, we're going we're gonna to run forward as fast as we can on the counter and really, really hit you hard. And that was pretty much it. I mean, Celtic did not have control. Celtic did not seek control. They almost were letting them have the, have the ball and then turnover after turnover because, you know, they... They didn't change their game plan in either half, right? They continued to try and hit channel balls after channel ball after channel ball. I mean, Joe Hart averages uh, just over six recoveries a game. He had 14 in this game. 
and that's and that's because only because the wind was so strong, a lot of them just went out for goal kicks, right? So you know, this this was this was um, you know the game plan. So in terms of the midfield, it really was a case of once you get it, get it forward. And what I really enjoyed was the fact that you know you had uh, Kyogo dropping into the ten space, trying to tempt one of the centre backs out. And because you know Taverni is a really dozy positionally, and then Sterling on the other side is uh, had a decent game actually to be fair to him, but they were trying to get forward as as they do, um, and so the the idea was then to hit the wingers and 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 then find the space, and that worked out pretty well. I think Kuhn could have done better with a couple. He he cut inside when he should have gone around the outside, mm-hmm. um, but actually he got on the ball a lot in that first half. Hatati for his part. Actually, to be fair to him, he led the team in terms of you know pack passes at half time. He had at uh, eight, um, hadn't created any chances. I think he had four shots. A couple of them you know, really hurried, hurried Butland up a little bit. So they were with the wind. It made it made sense, but it really wasn't a game of midfield control. It was a game of Celtic countering. And and then that was the transition. We talked about this last week. It's all about the transition. Uh, they didn't alter the game plan, even though the wind was playing havoc. They couldn't hit the channels because Silva and Wright kept kept coming in and inverting, and and there was just no options out, out wide. So they were really limited as to what they could do. And um, so so you know it was a tactical you know tactical uh, win, absolutely absolutely you know comprehensive for Rogers uh, in that first half that did it. But it, I wouldn't say it was through midfield domination. It was through um, essentially letting your opponent beat themselves in terms of just turning the ball over constantly and then breaking with speed and then causing havoc that way. Um, and, and to James's point, uh, it's very rare in professional football to see wind actually materially impact a game to that extent. But I think it absolutely did uh, in that game. Um, but not to the extent that the second half the second half meant it was a game of two halves. That, that's an, a gross oversimplification. We'll probably come to that in a bit. Mm. Yeah, I guess what I meant by the midfield, not so much in that they had overall control of the game, more so that everything good that Celtic did in that first half came from the midfield, getting the ball and playing the right pass, getting getting finding space, be that Kyogo finding the number 10 slot or Hatate just drifting into that slot with Matt O'Reilly on the ball and getting just creating options for people, which is something that has not been there over the course of the year and in, in many, many games, is that one more option in the midfield to give the ball to. Um, rightly so on Kuhn, I think at times I was just screaming at him to take his man on, take Sterling. He has the pace and he had the wind. It's just like, just take him on, get down to the channel and just get a ball into the box. I think he he probably was the disappointment for me in the first half was that he just didn't show enough bravery in that aspect. Um, but James, like... Uh, the wind played a role, but at the same time, it was what Alan is saying there. It was the situation where Celtic had a game plan and they executed that game plan and they could have scored. Am I I'm, am I oversimplifying it? I don't know what the XG was for some of these chances, but in my mind, Celtic could have scored three at a minimum in that first half and potentially should have scored four if you count the header. Yeah, I, not, none of those were um, what I'd call guilt edge. I mean, they were all kind of in the, uh, you know, 10% type. Um, does the does the Maeda chance where he yeah, should have gone to the corner, that like that for me, if that's Kyogo, that's guilt edge, edged. It's yeah, just yeah, that, that, with that, that was the one exception. Um, but again, then you could counterbalance that with Silva having two relatively close um, uh, chances you know, from like eight yards, uh, that Hart did an excellent job at stopping. So, and quite frankly, they weren't great finishes either. I mean, it kind of, kind of the, they were very comparable, the Maeda and Silva, um, incidents. So yeah, I, I, I think, um, the other part of this, and I, I chuckled when I saw the lineup, um, because it, the, the way Rangers played in the Benfica tie, um, you know, it was clear distinction between when uh, Clement selected Lawrence or uh, Cantwell. And um, to Alan's point, I mean, it, I, I think it was explicitly the game plan for them to go long through the channels, which, you know, kind of makes sense if you're going to go with Lawrence because he does stay higher typically. He's not one to drop deep and help with buildup. 
Um, but at the same time, they're relying on, rather than just going direct with Butlin to facilitate this long ball, they, they were trying to get it out wide and then kind of half-ass build up um, and go long with Tavernier and, and Goldson, um, which opened this opportunity because, I mean, you know, this, I, I've, it, it's been, I, I hope they continue with it because I think it's a huge glaring issue for them. But mm. the, this b- focus, the focal point of John Lundstrom is your buildup player is just insanity. I mean, he's such a donkey on the ball. And um, so that really limited them. And, and so they were keeping kind of four deep with the, their back four. And then Lundstrom and Diamande, um, whereas in the Benfica games, what they would do when they had Cantwell in the lineup is Lundstrom would drop in to, as a center back. They'd play three and then Cantwell would drop. So, that you know, they'd have a, a different composition of players um, because, you know, Lundstrom with his back to the defense, collecting the ball from Tavernier or from Butlin and then having to turn and distribute the ball under pressure or to pass it back. I mean, it just invites pressure. So I say long may it continue, uh, with, 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 um, their strategy, but yeah, I, relative to the wind, them, you know, kind of half-assing and quite, you know, let's just say it. I mean, Tavernier was awful. I mean, he was mm-hmm. putrid, particularly yeah. in the first half, um, as was Silva. Silva was pretty putrid. Lawrence was terrible, terrible in the game. I mean, I, there were a couple of sequences of play where he actually did have an opportunity to, to, to make a, you know, a quality pass that could have really put us under pressure. And again, if you watch the Benfica games, uh, which I tortured myself to do it, he did the exact same thing against Benfica. Like he just, yeah. you know, because he, you know, to to glorious Joey Barton's point, he's a championship level player. I mean, he's just not that good. Uh, same with Lundstrom. And, you know, at this level with the way Celtic were set up and playing and the other deficiencies and Tavernier playing horribly and Goldson, not that great. And we've talked about him being, you know, looking to, uh, to be in clear decline. You know, it, it, it was, uh, they made a lot of mistakes and that, mm. you know, a lot of it was because of us pressuring them, but some of it wasn't, some of it was just us, them being awful. Mm. Well, here, here's my unanswerable question for this week is why is it, is it an ego thing, which I presume it is, but why do they not set up against Celtic in the same way they set up in the Europa League? Because the Europa League model is clearly a successful model of, of tactic that they have. It clearly gets the best out of the players. They get big results against teams that are better than them on paper, but they don't do it against Celtic, which I think is the obvious logical explanation or obvious logical thing to do against a team that is going to be more possession-based and attacking the new Allen. So, so, you know, like many things in in Scottish football, a seemingly imponderable question has an answer in plain sight. Listen to Clement. He, he will give you the answer. What does Clement talk about in virtually every interview or in the run-up to a big game? He talks about the mentality of his players. Why does he continually talk about the mentality of his players? It's because he's really concerned about that. Now, when you're playing Benfica or in the latter stages or away in, against some Spanish team, you know, you don't have to you don't have to be worried about the mentality of your players to set up a coherent game plan that's a little bit defensive and a little bit counterattacking. Yeah, but if you're trying to convince your players that they can win this league, you need to go on the front foot against Celtic. And again, after the game, he continually talked about the mentality of his players before the game, and he talked about it after the game because he realizes that that there's a that there's a concern there. So they had to be seen to be going on the front foot against Celtic. But as as James says, I mean, I joked before the game, you know, that front four: Silva, Lawrence, uh, Wright, and Dessers. I, I, I mean. Objectively, that feels like you're back to sort of Waghorn and Halliday type lineups. You know, what I mean, in terms of quality, you know, I'm probably over egging that a little bit, but that isn't a great, a great lineup. And Celtic shouldn't be worried by that. And you know, so I think, I think, you know, I think it's, the, I think it's probably ego. I mean, you can see that Philippe's a little bit edgy, uh, and he's he's very, very focused on on the mentality of his players because he clearly sees a deficit as Taverny, who's the captain of that squad, has has mentioned in the past. That there is a concern there about the mentality when the crowd get on their back when 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 things are not going well, and and you know, if you think about this game, it, it's it's one thing, and you'll know this, Enda, you, you're still playing. It's one thing as a player 
to show a bit of fight when you're losing a game, right? It's quite another thing to go into a game and it's nil-nil and can you impose yourself? And in all three games, when it's been level, Celtic have imposed themselves. And most of the XG, in fact, nearly all the XG that the Rangers have generated in these games has been when they've been chasing the game. So that mm. he's absolutely right to talk about mentality, but he has to go front foot. And to James's point, long may it continue. Yeah. Well, it sort of reminds me of like Manchester United at the minute because they just have gaping holes all over the midfield because they don't have anybody to sit and be the holding midfielder or to cover those positions. And instead of fixing that, they just play in the most chaotic and open possible way because they're Manchester United and they, uh, sense. they don't they want to be defensive. How many billions did they spend on Casemiro, the greatest defensive midfielder? No, and I know. They've, but... got this, they've got this main you who's supposed to be the greatest English player that was ever born. How is that possible? And I don't understand that. <laughs> but this is what I mean. Like, there should not be holes. There are. And instead of being like the easiest thing in football is to be compact. That's all, all you need to do is be compact. All you need to do is maintain discipline and stay in position. That's all you have to do. And they won't do it because they're Manchester United and they can't be seen to be doing this. It's beneath them. And that's sort of where I what I get from the, the Rangers thing. is I, I actually think Rangers would beat Celtic if they played in the same way, in the same shape, in the same formation and the same tactics as they do in the Europa League. Because there is enough results in Europe from them to show that they're capable of getting good results against better teams. Celtic are a better team. The logical thing for me is to do what we also we always do against better teams and get results. And ultimately, I'm glad, happy, happy days, that they wanted to come toe-to-toe with Celtic and go man-to-man at times because, you know, the gaps were there and it was clearly shown that Celtic were the better team in that first half. Um, in terms of the turning point then, because that is there is a, there is a clear before and after in this game of when things went wrong. I predicted that Celtic would be 2-0 up in last week's preview podcast, and I said that there would be a James Tavernier penalty. I got the timing wrong. I said it was going to be around the uh, the 80th minute. It came much uh, quicker than that. Um, and it came from Fabio Silva, who had been throwing himself across the ground. I'm surprised he still had any bit of his kit without muck on it. He'd been on the ground that much. It was so it was, it, it absolutely embarrassing from any perspective of professional football. Um, and then he throws himself to the ground again. The Rangers fans behind the goals who don't even who have the best view of it, they even they are slapping their faces in disgust that uh, he's done it again. <laughs> Get up is almost the feeling that you got from watching them. Um, John Beaton, the referee, gives the correct on on field decision in a yellow card for a dive, and then VAR gets in his ear and overturns it and gives a penalty. Um, I mean, like, James, w- when you look at the replay that they showed to VAR, there is clear contact. He's going down anyway, but there is clear contact from uh, Johnston. But what they very, I would say, uh, accidentally, let's say accidentally, uh, didn't show the point of contact with the ball before that. Um, and that changes the picture. Changed the entire picture of that, that foul. So I had a nice uh, Twitter exchange with the uh, one of the guys that's running the account for Behind the Whistle, the referee podcast in Scotland. Um, and, you know, after, after a fairly uh, extensive back and forth, I, I understand why the decision was made now. It makes, you know, relative to the interpretation of the law, the law as it's written, um, basically what you know what walsh and ultimately beaten decided at least this is the supposition is that the contact after the ball was touched meaning that the ball being touched is not the relevant point as the rule is written uh if there's an unfair contact made after touching the ball it doesn't have to be excessive force it doesn't have to be you know a a horrible foul it just has to be unfair which is obviously a subjective aspect um so there there's the, the you know to me the the room for debate here is not whether the ball was touched that's not a relevant point uh it's the subjective nature of was the kick and he did kick him i mean it was light of course silva bought it um 
But we see that all the time, which is, you know, attacking players get touched. It's not enough to bring them down, but they go down anyway. Um, and he was clearly play acting the whole game. And I think it's fair to say that, that he, he embellished that as well. Um, was it unfair contact, given the fact that he probably was going directionally towards the ball if he didn't throw himself down? <laughs> um, I, do I think it's completely unreasonable that that was the interpretation? No, I don't actually. Um, do I think it was clear and obvious? You know, relative to, I think, Beaton's interpretation of the live event, and again, they, we'll, we'll get into Mr. Beaton's performance overall, I'm sure, but uh, because of what had been happening and Silva clearly being a total a-hole throughout the game, his, you know, his impulsive response was, here he's done it again, and he did card him for, for a dive. So uh, I, I think that you can draw the supposition that he didn't think there was any contact. So is it clear and obvious that there was contact? And then this subjective part of was it, you know, unfair that the nature of the contact? I don't know. Um, but I think relative to the fact pattern, I don't think it's the most egregious call. I mean, there was others in the games that I think were worse, <laughs> far worse, actually. Uh, you know, the head, the head uh, tra trauma to Yang being the most obvious and glaring. Um, so, you know, I get, it. I don't like it, but within the grand mm. scheme of things, after it's been explained to me so, and I, I kind of thought about it, I was like, okay, that I, I get how it, we got to that point, even though well, I don't like the, it. Yeah. The one thing, and I know Alan, you want to come on in this, but the one thing I will say is that <clears throat> It doesn't. I it do, uh, further to that rule. It doesn't matter if there's contact. There needs to be sufficient contact in order for the player to go down. That is part of the penalty procedure. So that is that is also a part that they would have had to take into account. Was there sufficient contact with the player that brought him down? And the answer is categorically no, because he was going down firstly in the first place, and then he throws himself to the ground in a manner not adding up to the amount of contact with him. So for me, I think it changes the course of the game and it was a decision that was taken out of Beaton's hands because he made the right decision on field and he was told in his ear, this is a penalty. Alan? So, so, so James, you know, you, you've been absolutely, on the one hand, you've been absolutely reasonable in how you have described that conversation and the interaction and the interpretation of the laws, okay? But, but it's an but, 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 but this is why I avoid debating single incidents, even in relation to what's written in the laws, because it's a zero-sum game. The laws are voluminous, right? They, they are very, very long, okay? Um, and, and therefore, and there is a huge degree of subjectivity within them, and which is why I, I try and look at the, the patterns over a long period, not the individual incidents. And, you know, Somebody showed an example uh, of a game earlier in the season where I can't remember the Celtic player who it was went down in the box against Kilmarnock, and and the the media and Scottish refereeing community, like you've been speaking to, reaction was not every contact's a penalty, and uh, uh, you know you know just just be just because he went over doesn't mean to say that you know he was already on his way down. All that right? So so we're back to the coin flip. We're back to the coin flip. OK, and what the patterns of assistance establish is that if you look at an incident like that, right, you can go two ways. You can go, seen them given, he's touched his knee, there's contact, or you could go, oh, that's not enough for me. Not every contact's a penalty, you know, and he was going down before, before uh, he was even touched, right? Heads or tails. So why is it, why is it, if it benefits one team, it's always heads? And if it benefits another team, it's always it's always tails. And I say always, I don't mean always, on a probability basis, as a pattern, statistically significant over a long period of time. That's the issue. That is the issue. In, in, in a nutshell, all of these calls are subjective. They're all subjective. Therefore, what we should expect is that over a long period of time, multiple seasons, Celtic get, get away with the same number, roughly, as they concede of those. But we know one team doesn't. On a consistent basis, that's the issue. I, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, what, what, what I was getting at was more so that I, I think there's some discussion that 
it's black and white with this call. I mean, that this was, you know, there, there's well, a no, line they, between. They never are. They rarely are. They rarely well, right. are. Well, but, you know, with the Yang head knock, it was. I mean, he, he yeah, looked yeah, right yeah. at it. He clearly got a head knock. It should have been blown dead immediately. Right. Yeah. So there are, there are, inc- you know, the, the um, I would argue that the, um, the handball call was, you know, bl- you know, my understanding of the rule, a black and white one. Like that was a clear yeah. handball. Right. No so there are, there. Is, yeah. Right. So there are clear instances. What I, what I was clarifying more so that my thinking going into it was like, well, you know, th- th- this comment, because you, you, know, you get pundits like Michael Stewart saying, well, he got the ball, right? That's making it black and white because he got the ball. What happened afterwards? It's not that. It is a judgment call to your point, Alan. So th- th- all I was saying is that it's not a black and white, you know, he's a cheat relative to a, you know, if had they not given the handball after reviewing it, that would have been blatant cheating, right? So this this one, to your point, there was enough room here for reasonable people to disagree, I think. Yeah. Like, it's one of those, to your point, one of those, you know, mosaics of what's fair, what's unfair, built into the rules as far as being interpreted, um, as opposed to this was a clear incident that it was no way is it a penalty, Um yeah, that's the only. So, point I, I, so, 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 no, so we're, so we're I, in violent disagree. We're in violent agreement. We're in violent. We're in violent agreement on all of that. But to come back to Inda's in, introduction, where he kind of danced around the topic of the v, what the VAR did, and it, it, it was an accident, right? Like, and I know he was just being humorous, but let's look at that then, okay? So, because this is black and white, I think, right? So, if, if, if what I what I observe, for example, in in rugby, and what we actually saw well implemented when Beaton dug himself into a hole with the goal that got disallowed, is that they go back and they look at what's called the attacking phase of play, the APP, right? Was there anything in the build-up that would should would mean that I reverse the decision to award the goal? Is around about the question that a rugby referee would ask. Um, did they look at the attacking phase of play for the uh, that penalty? No, they didn't. the The VAR image was one millisecond after Alistair Johnson had touched the ball. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you show? The attacking phase of play, the lead up, the angle that you know Silva came into the box, Johnson's body shape. Was there any contact outside the box before they came into it? All these things are material. You you need to give the referee that information from to form a clear picture of the challenge that then happened. What he actually did was he showed him halfway through the challenge, the end of it, at the point where Johnson makes contact with uh, Silva's knee and completely ignores the build-up and the attacking phase of play and the context that Johnson had actually uh, previously won the ball. Why would you do that? Where Where is your mind supposed to go, right? Other, other than to say that is in a deliberate attempt to, 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 to lead the referee down a certain path. Where else can you go with that? Yeah, so again, I'll steal me on that. Um, if, if the specific, and again, because I don't know, like this is not... As I, I always say, because I and why I, I generally am not a um, huge fan of getting into the refereeing decisions, because I don't know the laws of the game, is um, you know just for, on a logic basis, if the question is solely, is it an unfair challenge after the ball's touched? Meaning that if it was known that the ball's touched, he might have said it to him. The ball was touched. I mean, it right. So that that could have been something that. Because that was clear, like you, even from the the main angle, you saw a nick. He nicked the ball, um, and that, that James, even the James, broadcast. James, 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 sorry no. to cut across you, but let's let's not spend even t- any time on that, right? Because Beaton didn't think the ball had been touched, as you have you just said that, because he he stopped the play. Well, and right. So the, right. So if I'm the so, if I'm the so, VA- so, so, no, no, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Mm-hmm. The VAR procedures are very clear, and this is written into the VAR procedures. It is not for the VAR to tell the referee what the decision should be. It is up to the referee to make the decision. Therefore, if you want the referee to make the decision, you have to show him the full incident. You can't you can't curate it in a way that the VAR wants to limit what the referee sees. Because we've already established, Beaton didn't think it was a foul. Beaton is the one that has to make the decision. Beaton needs to see all the evidence. So, so I know where you're going with this, but that doesn't stand up. It doesn't. No, no, stand no right. I, 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 right. So, all I'm again, I'm steel manning this. So, if if I'm if I'm the VAR official, because again, they're walking a line between take having this take forever versus you know what what's the job of the VAR. So, there there is an objective fact: is did he touch the ball or not? 
So, you know, if, if, if I'm a VAR official and I see that he touched the ball, I can communicate that to the official and saying, yes, he touched it, that he got the ball, right? So if the, if the, if the judgment call was, and it, this is my reading, after it was explained to me this morning, that the, the, the area for the argument to occur is, was it unfair contact after the ball was touched? And the you video can't tell that, that unless you see the full challenge. You cannot see. You cannot tell that unless you see the full context of the challenge. You're basically telling the referee, who's the one that has to make the call. It's on his head. I'm making the decision, not you, buddy. So I want to see the full context. A rugby referee would want to see the full context, and they would they would have a discussion along the lines of, "Yeah, I can see the ball being touched. Yeah, I can see the contact." Are we are we thinking well, that's that's enough, guys, or are we are we not? You well, this, this the is also context. the problem with. It's more of a problem with VAR than it is with and and general football and the way the football interpret things in general versus the way that rugby is doing, where you can hear what the referee's conversation right. is and you can hear what the other guy's conversation is. Whereas in football, you are totally blind and you do not know what they're saying and it's not communicated to you what is going on. So it's not a transparent process from the beginning. So that the pre- lack of transparency leads to controversy because people don't know how decisions are come, made uh, made and, and come to the conclusion and that benefits nobody other than the people who are making these decisions uh, so uh, to, to move on from that because we don't have we don't have a whole lot of time today <laughs> to, to just spend talking about the one decision but let's talk about the aftermath of that and the the way that the game changed what happened Celtic in the period between being 2 0 up and in control to Rangers now being within a goal after scoring their penalty and then suddenly the, uh, the the way that the game is going seems to be flipped what what's going on on the pitch right there so, so I think you let me address this game of two halves myth okay so aside from that incredibly incredible penalty right the the home team didn't have a single shot at goal from half time until the 80th minute not a single shot. Okay, apart from that one penalty, so this is hardly the Alamo that we were led to believe was. And and then and then you know the two goals after that. I mean, Matondo's is a worldie, you know, great strike. The second one's a horrific. Uh, really, both of them are on Celtic players. Uh, ultimately, um, there was about 0.8 xg that I think they generated in the last sort of ten and minutes plus plus added time. So. So, you know, they continued to hit long ball after long ball. Now, they improved off the ball because they went man for man, and that's that basically stopped Celtic getting any kind of foothold in the game in terms of um, control of the ball. Uh, and Celtic were not able to, you know, go as long as easily because they had this enormous wind against them. They didn't have a target man anyway. So it all became a little bit um, back to the wall, and Celtic dropped very, very deep. But having said all of that... They didn't change their approach with the ball. They just kept locking channel ball after channel ball. After channel. Sima Matondo didn't create a single chance in the whole time they were on the field, right? I know they think, oh, they changed the game. Yeah, I know they scored, you know, they both scored a goal. Fair enough. But they didn't create a single chance. No shots for 35 minutes <laughs> from open play when you're, when you're losing the game, okay? Celtic, to my mind, in that second half, basically, you know, it's on Rodgers in terms of the substitutions that he made. Uh, basically lost we lost control any control that we we could have had of the game I think went out of it that time mm. I mean we all talked about McGregor before the game um, and he came on after th- six to five minutes I mean Hatati was pretty much done by half time six to five was, minutes yeah. um, you know McGregor comes on and I was shocked at how p- physically poor he looked and and he should and to my mind listen hindsight is perfect right uh, and when we're talking about substitutions, you're either a genius or a dunce, and there's nowhere in between. But you know, I'll give people credit for changes that, and tweaks and tactical manoeuvrings that have a positive outcome. These did not have a positive outcome, and in fact, directly led to Celtic um, losing the game three-three. You know, the McGregor um, had, apart from the had one pass, uh, actually the, the pass to Bernardo, uh, which is a p- great pack pass, which then Bernardo set up. Ida was his one main kind of contribution. But he was, you know, he was struggling physically. He was struggling to track back. Uh, you could see that, you know, even Diamandi, who was, who was, who seems to struggle a physically the more the game goes on. He he was out of his puff by the round about the same time. He was running McGregor, and McGregor was only just on the pitch. Um, he just didn't physically look up to it, right? So why we didn't put on this this defensively sound Bernardo, 
uh, at that point is is on Rogers, and the second one, of course, is Yang. We know that Yang has been he oscillates between absolute brilliance and garbage. You know, like he looks like he's ne- the kid's never played the game at a professional level in his life, and 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 he tends to really more violently oscillate between these two points. Most football players operate in the in the normal distribution of activity. Yang seems to operate at the margins. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. And again, hindsight, Yang had played quite well in games leading up to this, but then so had James Forrest. And if you want a player who's a wide player, who's safe on the ball, who's going to hold the ball, who's going to pick a sensible pass, might not be very dynamic these days, but he's going to keep the ball, he's going to take you up the pitch, uh, when you are throwing, you know, at halfway, little things like that, right? Then, you know, James Forrest is, is, is an excellent, experienced, been, seen it all, done it all person to come on and, and fulfill that role. Yang, he gave away four out of nine passes. He absolutely butchered when he got the ball twice in their box in the second half in really good areas. One of them almost led to a counter-attack chance for them. It was that bad. And then, you know, f- between the two of them, McGregor and Yang, you know, they were responsible for that second goal. And then, you know, Celtic must have sat down and watched videos. They must have seen that last week Matondo cut onto his right foot and stick one in the top corner against Hibernian. And and, and and in big moments and big games, you need your players to be switched on mentally and, and, and see the threat. And he completely, I don't know what he's doing to let Matondo, you know, Yang, to let Matondo, yeah. you know, cut in. And, well, I'll and tell it. you what he did. <laughs> you know, again, well, no, this is, again, this is one of my cross-sport analogies, which is, you know, I'm a 76ers fan and they, they have a point guard, uh, Maxi, who, who's like Matondo, right? You, he he almost always goes right. You can scout him. You can tell your players f- all, until you're blue in the face. Everyone knows that Maxi goes to his right the vast majority of the time, but he's so damn quick that he does that little jitterbug, and Yang dropped his jock. Like that's what we called him. You know, that's what we, he lost his jock. He got juked, and it's one of these things that in the moment you some guys are so freaking quick. And if you that one angle that that uh, Rangers media put out of the goal, I mean, you see how quickly Matondo shifted his body and moved about three yards in an instance to create that space. So I don't think there's any circumstances, even if Yang is expecting him to go inside, no. that that he well, closes that. I'm sorry, space. James. J- no, James, he, 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 he's going to be closer to the shot. And, and, but, talking so about if Neymar. He's, if he's, if he's completely hedged on the inside, maybe I would agree. Like if he's playing off the shoulder and totally shading him to give him the baseline or to the touchline to go left, then I could. Yeah, but he was square mm. on him, and Matondo just created the space. So, right. So, sorry, if you're if you're talking about Neymar here, who's somebody who operates at the world class, and I, you know that he's going to go a certain way, and you, he's so fast, he's so talented that you can't stop it, right? Fine, but we're talking about Rabbi frickin' Matondo here. Okay, uh, in this, this, look, go back and look at that instance. That was no, a Neymar move. No, no, I'm not saying he's going to all you need that. to do, all you need to do, is not let him cut in as a professional footballer. If you, 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 if you know your job, you know who your direct opponent is. That's all you need to do in that moment, right? So how you know? Listen, the, the substitutions change the game, but not in Celtic's favour. That, that's on that's on Rogers, and that you know that 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 is really what had the biggest impact. Because as I say, they created nothing in that second half. This wasn't the Alamo. This was long ball after long ball yep. going to Joe Hart's feet or flying out of play. This wasn't some you know Clement masterclass, right? That's the point I'm trying to make. This was self-inflicted by Celtic. Well, hundred percent Cal- agreement on that. On Cal McGregor, I mean, like you, you would give out to a twelve-year-old for what they did there. That is, it's the most criminal pass in football: a square ball across your own box without looking. You do not yeah. do that at, under it, any circumstances. I don't, I, and like there, it is an unforgivable pass. It, in, it was this, a sec- second one, by the way. He made one yeah. almost immediately after coming in. He, he, it wasn't as criminal, but it was directionally as you know in yeah. <laughs> in the same uh, neighborhood of bad. Um, um, shortly after coming on, but it, that one unfortunately didn't turn it, into anything. Yeah, the most annoying part about it is that I had said that he was so safe in that area <laughs> before the game, and then he goes and betrays me like that. But then on on Yang, right? So I I thought Adamita was actually a really good substitution. I thought he did really really well 
Um, to his credit, his hold-up play was brilliant. He got past the players a couple of times. The one where he skins, I think it's probably Goldson, given the side that was yep. on, yeah, and was he cool, gets yeah. a cross in. That's where you want Kyogo. That's not where you want Yang, because Kyogo gets to that ball, in my opinion. I think he's on his toes and gets to that, sees the move there quicker than Yang was. So that that's one thing you can slightly forgive Yang for. But I, I'm on Alan's side here. That that defending is fucking criminal. For a player of his age, I don't care how little experience you have. I don't care if it's a little shimmy. and a, it, it is good for Matondo. You have to give him credit. Good shimmy, good turn, good shot, bang, great goal. You have to give him credit. It's not fucking Aaron Robin. It's I, Matondo. And and I, 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 to Yang's credit, or not to his credit, but to Yang's, let's give him a benefit of the doubt here. That's a situation where you should have two defenders from a tactical point of view. The right back should be over there preventing the cutback. It shouldn't be up to Yang to get the cutback. It should be up to the right back. Right back's not there. What do you do? You do the right back's job. You force him down the line and tr- force him to try to get across in. It's basic defending. And it's it's not even, it's not the cutback. It's not the, it's not the predict, not predicting the cutback. It's the cutback. And he just drops. He just drops his arms and doesn't fall. At least try get a deflection on it. And that's the most criminal aspect of this. It's not that he didn't expect it. It's not that he was done by Matondo. It's that he just stops. And he should not be brought on in a game with that magnitude. If that's your attitude, if that was Mikey Johnson, he would be absolutely slaughtered by everybody in the Celtic uh, dugout and everybody in the Celtic uh, uh, seats. If there were any fans in the stadium, I don't see how Yang can get away with this without being dropped and without being punished from a professional football standpoint. It was just completely unacceptable. I, I, I'm not disagreeing it's unacceptable. I'm not disagreeing it's bad defending. What I'm saying is that when you get a guy that's as quick as Matondo, and I'm obviously I'm not comparing him to Neymar. I mean, being able to do these things on a repeated basis with consistency is what distinguishes you know great players from Matondo. Okay, but he does have the athleticism to pull that move. And my whole point, this is why I specifically called it. He dropped his jock. Right. Again, for people that play basketball, you know exactly what I'm talking about, is that when a guy makes a move that just all you have to be is slightly leaning like a margin, an ounce off the wrong foot when a guy that quick makes that move. And when you throw your hands up, it's when you dropped your jock. He got caught. He got wrong footed. It was terrible. But what I'm saying is, I don't think if he's right footed and squared up, he would have had to have been hedged to your point, Enda. He didn't have help inside. So he either had to usher him to the the touchline or he was going to get inside. He had to make one of those two decisions as quick as Matondo is. And Yang is not a great defender, but neither is James Forrest, by the way. So the exact same thing could have happened to James Forrest. Okay. And, And a lot. And even Johnston, right? Johnston's not that quick. I mean, Matondo is going to pull that move on a lot of people. Is he going to top shelf it consistently? Of course not. Okay, but and you probably you want to try and force him to the to the end line. But how do you do that? You either need really shade inside, or you need help. And you're right; it was terrible defending. He didn't both didn't do both. But because he was squared up, there was no way he was stopping that squaring him up the way he did. And the yeah. fact that he was a little off balance that's how he lost his jock. I'm just explaining. so. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of passion on the podcast the last couple of weeks. A lot of, it's it's uh, the the nature of a title race like this. So then, Alan, after this three uh, three win for Rangers, um, are, are they favourites for the league now going forward? Do you have Celtic slightly favourites? Uh, ultimately, as we wrap this up, what's your conclusion uh, from the the aftermath mm-hmm. of this? I, I, well, I, you know, you, you you summed it up well, and in, uh, in the you know, this opens the door for them to come to Celtic Park and, and and play as if they were playing away in Spain or Portugal or something like that in a Europa League game. And if they do that, I think they've got the I think they've got the the team that, that could can make a good fist of that. And um, now whether they'll do that or not, I don't know. Clement is an incredibly emotional guy, it seems, and and I think he he wants his team to win this league. So I I sus- rather suspect that ego trumps common sense on that one, but we'll see. Um, but you listen. There's other there's other tricky games to come as well. Celtic have got to go to Kilmarnock is just one example. But you know, this is where this is where having players that have been through this before and don't get phased by having to win these games it does help at a mental mentality level with you know in terms of attitude and all that non measurable stuff. 
um, versus a team who have consistently failed in the past to get over the line, uh, or are, or like Goldson and Taverni have just been you know battered and have scars to show it time and time and time and time again, you know. But then you know sometimes you're more motivated if you've never done it. Uh, you know all of that comes into it. But on a practical level, Celtic have got I think uh, what is it? You know uh, five home games and two away games or something like that, and and they've got something like the opposite. You know that, 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 and that's going that's going to have a factor as well. Just obviously it's, it's clearly a little bit more tricky playing uh, playing away from home. Um, Celtic may well still lose this, as I say. But you know, I've got no doubt they're a better football team. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say you win. You win always win the league. These, these, uh, these. You know, the, the 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 expected points model is is within about a point. I think at this stage in the season, add in the impact of honest mistakes, that that probably you know makes it a slightly bigger gap. Frankly, so all these all these things come into it. James, final word to you. Yeah, I mean, I, the the bookies have. Rangers, you know, uh, a, a favorite, not a huge favorite, but as you would expect with the game in hand, effectively, if they, you know, again, big if, um, but if they, if they, uh, get those three points, they've got a, a two point lead and that, you know, so, some of the, um, you know, rhetoric coming out of the game, as far as Celtic having self-determination, we do, and you certainly would prefer to play at home. Um, but to Alan's point, they, you know, all other things being equal, they just need not to lose the game. You know, that is a material difference. That's a big difference going into that last game, uh, the last RB. So, uh, you know, I, I think you have to um, make them the favorites at because of that. Um, and all other things being equal, we have the hardest away game in the post split. You know, we've got the, the you know, I think it's going to be uh, three home, two away. But Kilmarnock is by far based off of who's left in, <laughs> in the competition, um, you know, going to Kilmarnock is not going to be fun at, at any point, given the way Kilmarnock plays and that they're reasonably well um, coached. So yeah, we've talked about this forever, that, that that's the kind of game that w- has worried Allen and I the whole freaking season. And hopefully with us getting, you know, players back and more fit. Um, but yeah, I, I I think you know it's certainly still skewed slightly in in Rangers' advantage because of the mm. the, the nature of the I, again it's not a, a, a over it's not something that can't be overcome obviously it's a, you know just with normal variance this is you know what we've talked about for a while now the fact that we've gotten to the point where um, their favorites and or variants can can um, determine the league is is you know a real problem but that uh, that's where we're we're at and uh, we've got to overcome it. I mean, there was, there, there, was well, sorry, there was, there was a moment, there was a moment, what's frustrating, I think for, is there was a moment, um, sometimes there is a moment, uh, and I think it was about the 42nd or the 43rd minute when Tavernier gave the ball away again, he, he played a square pass across halfway and gave it, gave it away. 43 minutes, Celtic a two nil up. And, and that place, that place was this close to open rebellion. And, and and Celtic Celtic had one hand on the title, I think, at that moment. Mm. But the the, um, the deathly silence after uh, Matt O'Reilly's penalty is one of the, it's a, a, a objectively funny, objectively <laughs> funny from any football <laughs> standpoint, um, and it pretty much sums up the weirdness of this derby at the minute with no uh, away fans in the stadium. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess we'll finish off the podcast. I never thought I'd say these words, but all eyes will be on Dundee tomorrow as uh, uh, Rangers play their uh, game in hand, uh, which could put them back on top hopefully. of the table. But... Or maybe not, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, I, I hear it's raining in Dundee. <laughs> so, <Here. laughs> Yes. And, 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 no, and, and, and this isn't a joke. This is true. And the penalty spot is, is flooded. And obviously, you can't God. play them without having, the, having a perfect, pristine penalty spot. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. That's that certainly uh, means to call up call off a Rangers game anyway, because that means the game's unplayable if the yeah, pretty much <laughs> the penalty spot's not available, and so on and so forth. And hardy ha ha. Uh, right, that's where we will uh, call an end to this week's uh, podcast. Um, disappointing, happy, who knows how everyone feels. Let us know in the comments below uh, how you feel after that derby game, and we shall uh, chat to you next week. Until then, good luck.